Hi, welcome to the first Learn at Home. Today's Learn at Home discussion considers how design can support the health and well-being of children and teachers in schools, but also thinking about learning across the life trajectory. We have three speakers to share their expertise on the topic, and I'm really pleased to welcome Diane Vella Broderick, a professor in positive psychology for the Melbourne Graduate School of Education at the University of Melbourne. She was the inaugural director of the Master of Applied Positive Psychology when it began in 2013. Welcome, Diane. Sure. Thank you very much, Claire. It's great to be here to talk about this important topic. I'm the research director at the Centre for Positive Psychology, and um, am, and I'm of the view that uh, someone's health and well-being is very amenable to change. And you know, having topics related to seeing how the environment can influence our well-being, as well as what individuals can do to um, influence their well-being and how those two things interact really excites me. So I'm looking forward to the conversations that we have today. Thanks, Diane. Our second guest is Ken Yi Fong, who is Senior Acoustic and Wellbeing Consultant for Arab Australasia. Ken is a world accredited professional and he's passionate about research in the cross-linked fields of acoustics, built environment design, wellness and staff happiness. Welcome, Ken. Thank you, Claire. I uh, feel very privileged to be part of this group. Uh, thank you for inviting me to this forum and uh, really looking forward to having a really positive discussion with Simon, yourself, uh, Diane as well. And I think just to echo Diane's words, this context is really, really important. I think when we talk about learning spaces, it does really touch the whole spectrum of, of uh, the human experience. And particularly, I think when we look at say K-12 facilities, you know, we, we are really setting up the next generation uh, for positive impact. And so I'm really pleased to be able to uh, speak to this forum. And really what I'll try to bring to this discussion is my experience and expertise in so holistic uh, built environment design, but also acoustics and research too. So looking forward to it. Thanks, thanks, Ken. And our third um, guest is Simon Goodrich, who co-founded the Melbourne-based office of Portable, firm of Portable and is Partner and Managing Director. Simon, you specialise in co-design strategies and UX or user experience design. So this is something that's really familiar to people in technology and web-based design and product design. But interestingly, UX design is actually not so common within the built environment. So we really value having you here as part of this discussion. Welcome, Simon. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity, Claire. I'm looking forward to joining yourself, Diane and Ken, to discuss. Um, yeah, at its, at its top level, our interest around user experience is what strategies and tools can be used to put users in the centre of the design, technology and built decisions, built form decisions that get made. So, yeah, looking forward to being part of the discussion this afternoon. We've got a really neat little format for our discussion. We're going to look at it Using the acronym of LEARN, so under L-E-A-R-N, we've got a suite of little interconnected topics. We're going to start with L, lessons, the big lessons around health and well-being. We're then going to go into E, some exemplars, some case studies, and these might be built outcomes or they might be successful processes. Then we get into A, for, from each of your perspectives, I think there'll be AIDS, um, tools, devices that you can introduce our listeners to. We get to R, uh, what do we know? This is the research, the evidence base behind each of um, your approaches and so learning from the different disciplines. And then we finish with next steps, well where do we go from here? So we're going to link these together in short little modules and people can pick and choose which they'd like to or listen from start to end. So Hey, let's start with these really big um, lessons. And Ken, I'm going to ask you, first of all, with, about the World Rating Tool. Tell us all about that. Sure. So the World Rating Tool, uh, or the certification uh, tool, really, is something that's quite new to the market. It's only been around since 2014. 
And uh, in Australia, at least, I think the adoption really only started in 2015. Re really what it seeks to do is provide a holistic framework in which we can uh, introduce interventions into the built environment to enhance occupant and human health and well-being. So there are interventions which are called features within the standard. And these are organized in 10 concepts. And they are healthy air, water, nourishment, light, movement, previously fitness, but now they've uh, you know, embraced a wider sort of definition of what physical fitness is. Thermal comfort, acoustics, material, and then two of the biggest additions since its recent iteration uh, in the community and the mind concept. So really people think of this just as a tool for physical factors, but it actually is a lot more than that. Certainly it covers three types of interventions. One being design features, the second being operational features, but thirdly as well, it really comes, uh, we, we're talking about cultural and organizational features. And I think that's evidence in how many interventions there are in the community and the mind concept as well. So the way uh, the well building standard works is um, you actually go through a scorecard and depending on how many interventions you can prove because there is a third party certification process in there, you actually get certified to different levels such as bronze, silver, gold or platinum and so on and so forth. Um, Ken, thanks. And as you were reading through that list, you are thinking, gee, they're very physical, they're very related to the indoor environment, so it was great when you got to community and the mind. And Diane, this is perhaps where your um, role around positive psychology is so significant in this discussion around design for health and well-being. Um, what are the big picture issues, the lessons that you can introduce us to, please? Well, certainly a major issue is that there is poor mental health um, in our community. And I think young people are especially vulnerable uh, with around one in five young people um, saying that they've experienced a mental illness in the past 12 months. So this is certainly something that um, we need to take into account when we're designing uh, spaces, particularly in learning environments. You know, it is important for us to take a more preventative and proactive approach to addressing this um, mental health issue that we have in our community. And I think that um, learning environments are the perfect opportunity to enable people to learn skills, to equip them with strategies that they can use to enhance their health and well-being. And so I think the learning environments are perfect for that. Um, I really like the way you talk about the learning environment as a vehicle for people learning skills. So it's not so much as a cause and effect where a new learning environment will result in people feeling much better about themselves, but rather it's a, it's a setting, it's a place. But it also says a lot, doesn't it, about how students are valued in that place. And it's a really good moment perhaps to move into Simon, where your expertise is very much about capturing user experience and understanding the viewpoint of the user and making sure that their voice is part of this discussion. Oh, so, I mean, from a, from a student perspective, I think there's many things that have been exacerbated uh, in this pandemic that we're seeing now in terms of health and wellbeing. And I, I, um, I concur with Diane and our own experience of work we do a lot of work at Portable and Mental Health, um, both with Origin and associated with the University of Melbourne and, and Headspace, again, another youth provider. And looking about some of the tools and strategies that they're looking to put in place to, I guess, work to reduce stigma, but also to uh, work to develop strategies um, for young people themselves to be able to feel more confident in being able to, I guess, in some ways, translate um, that research into things that are relevant for them. And in a lot of ways, that's, I, I think, a very key point towards um, human-centered design or user-centered design, co-design, effectively, where in many cases there is, uh, you know, a lot of uh, academic research, a lot of expertise that have been put forward, but that doesn't necessarily always equate to the audiences that they're seeking to either write about or, or talk to uh, as, in, as engaged or, or has a currency, I guess, specifically in what is being necessarily put forward. So part of the role that we see is something there is being able to bring those, those 
two worlds together. In some ways, a bit of a translation of both the academic research and the insights to also what the needs of specific communities are at the same time. And I think in many cases, uh, it does, uh, especially in regards to health and wellbeing, can be used as a really powerful tool to help to ideate for tools and strategies that can then be tested and trialled with those communities, you know, and, and, and breaking that down. And then through the use of um, technology and design also be able to be uh, tested and, and get feedback and data on to then help inform what that will mean for future direction, including also in a lot of cases, what that means from the built form. So, uh, and, you know, being able to bring those worlds closer together is something that we're really passionate about. Perhaps what we might do now is move on to our next letter, which is around exemplars and um, case studies. They might be built case studies or they might be successful processes. So let's think about exemplars. And Diane, we might start with you. Yes, well, I think um, the key thing here, in my view, is that when we're trying to promote wellbeing, uh, that one of the most, I guess, compelling ways of doing that is to make well-being visible, both um, explicitly and more implicit, implicitly through the culture. And so I think that um, when we look at it from a psychological sort of point of view, we really want to be able to um, demonstrate that we're promoting well-being through communication styles, through the language that we use, um, that there's a, an energy or a vibe that denotes sort of well-being and that you can see it in people's behaviour. And I mean, we can think of it more clearly when we're talking about physical health in terms of people eating well, in terms of being physically active, but behaviours that perhaps demonstrate acts of kindness or compassion um, and, and um, forming strong personal connection. And with regards to place, um, I think it's very important for places to promote social connection. Um, and provide variety with the social connection as well. So there's space for communal, communal um, types of interactions, but also more intimate, personal, more in-depth um, connections, and that it promotes movement. And I suppose that's one of the points that Ken listed earlier on. Um, movement is, is really important, um, but it also elicits a sense of engagement and curiosity. Um, it, you know, in, inspires some intellect and creativity as well. So somehow the individual has to connect with that space in a meaningful and personal way for them. Um, and the other quality I think is um, nature. We're so innately connected with nature and nature has um, therapeutic effects. It can reduce stress and it can restore cognitive capacities. So, you know, being able to, whether it's virtually or really, connect with um, blue space or green space um, can be really beneficial. And so I think, um, I don't know that there's one amazing case study that incorporates all of that, but there are certainly a lot of examples um, evident and, um, I love the Royal Children's Hospital um, approach, you know, even in a environment where there is so much, sadly, sickness, um, there's an opportunity to still experience well-being and positive emotions in that environment. And they've incorporated some of those elements, particularly with regards to nature. And they've got like uh, an aquarium in there that can be distracting, um, particularly, I think, in the emergency department, you know, where people can show extreme levels of um, distress. But I mean, I think schools, so if you try and... Um, look more specifically at learning environments and schools, um, I think what they can do really well is showcase some of the wellbeing initiatives that they've got. Um, so schools are embracing those types of opportunities. Um, so there's a couple of examples. That, that, was, that was a really rich description and it's quite an ecology, isn't it? It's, it's, it's not a matter of just getting one thing right. There's, 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 it's a, there's a lot of layers and a lot of scales involved. Um, if we 
Now sort of think about the same question of exemplars from your perspective, um, Simon, would it be a process that you would highlight or would it be a, a setting that you would highlight as an exemplar you'd like to share? I mean, I think uh, in, in a lot of cases, it is the sort of shift, especially within an educational context, um, and probably more happening at the secondary level and the tertiary level, of working with um, students to help co-design different ways of learning and through that, the actual environment themselves. So uh, in a lot of cases, I don't see that the work of user experience and co-design is, is, is particularly alien to in, within a learning environment. I think the words may be new, but the actual practices and processes, I think, have been um, quite, uh, you know, quite sort of common in terms of the way that it's been delivered, probably for the better part of, you know, the last 50, 60 years within, you know, the broader education system. And I think if anything about how that's now looking to shift um, the way that uh, the learning environment itself is, is changing. I think technology has a big role to play in there. I mean, if you all recognize, I guess, the, the role of, I guess, tablet technology over the last 10 years and how that shifted and changed, or even computers um, in, in an educational setting over the last sort of 35, 40 years has shifted and changed a lot. And it's good that the discussion is sort of moving away from purely the technology as a solution itself or as, you know, uh, let's have a computer to do a particular thing or a computer's just used for, uh, you know, computer-based subjects to really an enabler uh, for as a process for teaching. I even reflect on how my own children who are both in prep and grade three at the moment, they're going through their own learning environment in a virtual world now. Uh, my, my younger daughter's had a hundred days of school last week and she probably maybe like it was been 30 of them on campus. <laughs> but it's also the view that not necessarily that the kids are, are having the agency yet to be involved with in, in that component, but it is also it, it just even reflecting on my own sort of learning experience with my own children. It's seeing that a lot of the, the skills and strategies that we, we employ and use uh, are, are there at a very, uh, you know, at a fundamental level in terms of the way that, that things are being delivered in education. Right? No, and I think that's a really positive. Um, as students are learning away from the school setting, it's kind of interesting to reflect on what the school setting um, brings in terms of a positive experience for kids. And Ken, I'm wondering whether you might be able to add to this discussion. Yeah, sure. There are two that come to mind, Claire. Uh, one is very specifically related to the educational uh, sorry, like sort of K to 12 context. Um, the other one is actually related to the office setting, but that relates specifically to adult learning, right? So I'll, I'll speak about the first one. Uh, in Arab, we have this space we call the sound lab. A sound lab is what we describe as the perfect listening environment. It's a high tech room where we can oralize a space before it's built. Essentially, the same way architects allow you to visualize and see a space before anything actually gets built, we allow spaces to be heard. So it's one thing to sort of provide an opinion on how a space should be or not. It's another to just experience it. And so what we created was an ultra realistic simulation of what it would be if you were trying to listen to a class, a teacher speaking in front of you, but two simultaneous classes happening at the back, where there were no sort of guidelines around how these learning was to take place. And it was really, really interesting because before that demonstration, people had different thoughts and ideas about what had to happen in open plan. You know, it was very binary. It's really good and some were like, it's really bad. But what this allowed us to do is actually open up a discussion around acoustics because it's intrinsically linked, the acoustics of a space with learning outcomes. We know that from over three decades of research in this space, right, we know bad acoustics equals poor learning outcome. Very simple. And that's why educational spaces have a very close, uh, very precious place in my heart, especially now since I have two children as well. Then the second example, I'll pivot a bit more. Uh, it's actually related to the space you see in my background. And that's actually the Arab Melbourne workplace. Uh, so the Arab Melbourne workplace is quite unique. Certainly it's, uh, it has the highest well certification which is well platinum under the latest version. So we were quite afraid when we did the post-occupancy evaluation, we thought, uh, here we go, all the negative, the naysayers are gonna come in. But we were quite pleasantly surprised with this. So I was the wellness consultant for this entire project. And we saw not just meaningful improvements in physical space outcome, 
For example, acoustic satisfaction, thermal comfort satisfaction, satisfaction with light, amenities, facilities, meeting rooms, etc. That was good, right? Those were planned. But the thing that really struck us were in some of the engagement surveys that we carried out, it's the soft factors like loyalty, like advocacy of space, right? Like positive mental well-being outcomes calm, those types of factors all saw a meaningful improvement as well, right? statistically significant improvement in there as well. And so I think really when we think of office environments, really it's a medium or space for knowledge exchange, right? And that's what learning is. It's an exchange from knowledge from a teacher or pedagogical leader to the students or recipient of that information. And so if we essentially by extension, if you can extend the benefits of this in a workplace environment into a learning environment using the very same principles, because we're talking about people in space. Yes, the context might vary slightly, but the principles are able to give a really positive outcome in the metrics that we care about. I think that we've, we've heard some very different kinds of exemplars. And what we might do now is to finish that for the moment and then go on to some of the aids that are useful for people wanting to think more about health and well-being in learning environments. Okay, so we've considered lessons and we've heard some exemplars and it'd be great to just speak about some of the aids or the tools and resources that are available. And so maybe this time we'll start with, um, with you and thinking about what tools people might be able to use around co-design ideas or user experience or user-friendly designs. Yeah, no, sure, sure, Claire. Look, the, the, the positive thing I think with co-design is there is a very uh, strong uh, I guess, uh, resource activity on the internet to find a lot of these materials. Uh, you know, in terms of from an academic perspective, a lot of the learning from design thinking, co-design came out of Stanford in the 60s. Um, yeah, and um, yeah, D-School, yes, which is also associated with Stanford and organisations like Audio, also based over in San Francisco. So Audio's uh, been a a leading exemplar within the sector of being able to effectively open source a lot of their materials over the years. Um, you know, as an organisation, we certainly take, um, I guess, uh, inspiration from them. You know, we, we also do a lot of sharing. For instance, we've got a, a recent report around co-designing for purpose. Um, so, you know, I think through any, any sort of searches for the, uh, in terms, we'll get people the type of kits, the type of activities in a very sort of detailed format of how you could be running these activities with, with, with your users. And, you know, I, I very much think that it isn't necessarily, when we think of design, it isn't necessarily that you, you need to be, you know, a, an expert with 20 plus years experience in design. It's very much an enabling tool for people who have an interest and, and seeking to uh, derive further insights from the people that they're seeking to design for. Uh, um, so, yeah, I think um, those searches, um, looking at the, 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 the audio kit and, and others, I think are a really good place to start. Yeah, really good advice. And I'm going to give a plug for the uh, resources that are available on the portable website as well, because you at times through your user experience survey have put together these really targeted um, advice um, uh, brochures together, which I think are a great resource for, for everybody. Now, Ken, in terms of the well rating, are there any, you know, tools and aids that you would recommend? The well building standard, uh, it's a bit unfortunate. It's called the well building standard because really now I'm expand, expanding sort of the design thinking into communities as well. Uh, there are sort of large communities I'm consulting for also for buildings, certainly. Um, but it encompasses way more than just, just buildings. And I think it's a good tool. It's not the only tool, obviously, but it is a good tool uh, because it covers reasonably holistically, I think those 10 concepts uh, that we look at. And I think the way it's useful is in number one, exposing features that perhaps designers or educators may not, may not have thought of before. I think, I think that's really good as a starting discussion point, right? Sometimes we don't know what we don't know. I mean, that's just, that's just reality. And uh, it, there are 185 interventions within this building standard with, you know, slight offshoots as well there. 
that people can think about, consider at least, and then incorporate into their environments. And have principles of biophilic design found their way into the world rating system? Yeah. Oh, well, the way I describe biophilia, and this is my definition, right? Please don't quote me on this, is, is really we mimic nature or we give reference to nature in how we incorporate uh, their principles into our design. So you can see in the background here, there are actually more plants than people in our office. That's one element of biophilic design. It's not the only one. It's the one that certainly most people relate to straight away, but that's just one element. But there are other things in biophilic design, for example, availability of light. For example, just having uh, mimicry of open spaces. And you can see actually throughout our workplace, we have voids uh, that actually open up connection between different levels. That's one element of biophilic design. Uh, we have also cork. It's a natural material and that goes all around our office as well. And that actually provides a wayfinding function as well. So it's dual purpose, right? There's a natural element to it, but also where you know it's cork, uh, it describes circulation spaces too. And also in the well-building standard, under the mind uh, uh, concept, there's a huge section of biophilic design and we talk about how we celebrate nature, how we celebrate spirit, how we celebrate beauty. These are all elements that are incorporated into well-building standard. And I think that these, um, Diane, would be music to your ears. So perhaps um, you might introduce us to some of the positive psychology aids and tools available. Sure. I think um, within psychology more broadly, but uh, I think positive psychology has refined it even more. One of the key contributions that I think uh, can be made to this area of um, really thinking about design uh, features to enhance health and well-being in learning environments is um, to be able to measure the change that has occurred if indeed um, these design elements are, um, are working and, and that's really important because it gives us sort of a, an indication of where um, we need to focus our attention more or less on um, and it gives us credibility, I, I guess, in terms of what we're trying to do. So I think um, what psychology has done is it's enabled us to measure um, changes in well-being. First of all, to undertake a needs analysis, so to really understand what elements of health and well-being in particular need to be enhanced. Um, is it the community connection? Um, or is it other, other factors like trying to enhance um, positive emotions? Um, so first of all, the needs analysis tool is, is really important. And we've got something at the Centre for Positive Psychology we call um, the Wellbeing Profiler that we go out into schools and, um, and measure sort of the well-being of year levels and try and identify areas that can be enhanced. Um, but then we've got tools to actually measure well-being. So if uh, you're claiming that a design is going to enhance particular types of well-being, is it actually doing that? And um, you can ascertain that using more um, objective and qualitative, uh, quantitative sort of methods, but also qualitative methods. Um, perhaps, um, thank you all three of you for your answers around AIDS. And I noticed as, you know, Ken and Diane particularly, as you were talking about AIDS, you were talking about research processes as well and evidence-based um, tools. So that might be a really good moment for us to shift into our fourth of the five um, steps, which is around um, research. And... Um, Simon, you also spoke about co-design having its origins within Stanford um, University. Um, is there any evidence that you can introduce us to which suggests that these processes do have benefits or they are, they are founded on rigorous evidence? Yeah, I'm specifically within education, uh, look, I haven't I, 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 we don't necessarily come from a sort of academic background, so I don't haven't got papers there in front of me, but I know that through a search, there's many papers that are around co-design and the role that it does play within education. You know, and I think even at a, at, a, at a high level, you know, the view being that if you are talking to the people that are most affected for what you're doing, that, you know, the chances are you're going to have a better outcome 
Um, you know, I think that's relatively self-evident in terms of part of that thinking. And, and certainly in our own work in terms of levels of engagement um, is important. I think in a lot of cases, people do go towards a solution focused area very quickly and don't necessarily spend the time to actually immerse themselves a bit more in that defining the problem they're actually seeking to solve. Uh, and using design skills, whether it be in education or elsewhere, I think is leading to more leaner, smarter ways of developing solutions with communities and people and, and hence being more, more effective as an output. It might be really good to move into um, speaking with you, Diane, given that you're within the Melbourne Graduate School of Education, but you also bring a quite interesting um, psychology um, perspective to um, how we know what we know and whether we do know whether our interventions bring um, benefits. Sure. So um, there are a number of different theoretical perspectives that do support um, factors associated with um, promoting well-being, and, and in particular, I'll focus on two: so increasing um, positive emotions and um, in, increasing quality relationships. So um, you know, happy places and, and trying to design spaces that are bright. bright um, you know, involve nature that promote social um, activity and that enhance sort of movement and, and physical activity to some extent are, are important. What we find is that they tend to lead to greater health and immunity um, that um, increases quality relationships and therefore better productivity. And, you know, the research has been done Yes, a lot of the studies are correlational studies. Um, they look at a relationship, um, but many studies have actually looked at cause and effect as well and um, have found consistent findings. Um, and in particular, I'll mention one theory called broaden and build theory. And this theory um, proposes that positive emotions lead to a lot of really desirable outcomes. And um, the reason that's the case is because when we're in a positive state, um, we tend to look more broadly beyond ourselves. And it means that we're more willing to um, network. Um, we're more open to opportunities. And when we are more open to exploring opportunities, it means that we can gather resources and capabilities. So just by way of example, when you're in a good mood, you're more likely to actually wanna reach out and talk to a stranger. When you talk to someone that you, you don't know, they might have um, networks or um, mm. knowledge that can be helpful to you in some way. And that's really where... Really opening up learning opportunities, isn't it? So exactly right. So and you mentioned that was causal rather than simply correlational. Co correlational. It, is, it does seem that if you are in a positive frame of mind, there is a causal link to be more open to external possibilities. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. Like there, certainly there's an overwhelming number of studies that are correlational just because they're easier to, um, mm. to do, um, but there's a growing number of studies that are more experimental and, and um, can provide a sort of causal link. So absolutely there is evidence to suggest that if you um, design spaces to promote well-being that you're going to reap a lot of um, benefits desirable benefits and even with regards to a learning environment if um, you can improve emotional um, and social capabilities um, your learning um, improves quite markedly and there have been meta-analyses that compile a number of uh, smaller studies um, to demonstrate that you know, the effect can be quite substantial on uh, learning opportunities and outcomes. So um, I think the benefits are, are there. That's, thanks, Diane. And, and can, um, is there any further research that you might like to talk about in this little segment? Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> this is, this is uh, uh, an area I'm really, really passionate about. The way the WELL standard is useful is that it's very evidence-based and there are uh, references to research. In fact, the International Wellbuilding Institute, uh, which administers the Wellbuilding Standard, actually released a set of documents they call the Wellographies. And the Wellographies 
is a comprehensive research-based background of each concept. And in many cases, it goes down right down specifically to the specific interventions. And certainly even within the well-building standard, you can see the references to the research uh, that's you know, where it draws these sort of thinking from, right, to form the feature. And then the features then are graded by points according to their uh, impact on human health. Uh, also, I think in, we talk about co-creation quite a lot. The well-building standard was not created in a, in a silo. It was not one uh, sort of sector of designers coming together and creating this well-building standard. No, it was actually a very collaborative effort between building designers, between public health scientists, for example, between medical practitioners, between people in academia, uh, the research community as well, all coming together, inputting into a single standard. And one of the research programs I'm involved in now is, well, there's two big ones. Uh, one, I'm overseeing a research program where we're trying to pull in all the data streams for our workplace, uh, whether that's a human data stream, uh, post-occupancy evaluation, actual sensor data, because we do exist in a very data-rich environment here. Uh, we are trying to look at the correlation between all these factors and see how they actually meaningfully impact well-being. And especially now in COVID context, I've had to shift a bit because now we have to separate the physical factors versus the non-physical factors which now have to be translated into people working from home, right? How big is it? That's one. Uh, the second sort of piece of research, uh, you know, I'll probably be embarking in next year or, or whenever, is looking at the correlation between comfort and well-being. And people think they're one the same, mm. but a comfortable space where it has good acoustic comfort, good thermal comfort, good lighting comfort and all that may not necessarily be the biggest determining factor for well-being. Mm. And, and I think the, um, the descriptions by the three of you around research approaches shows how complex the issues are. They are quantitative, qualitative. There are issues of cause and effect versus correlation. There's um, uh, data which sometimes doesn't um, correlate with what your expectations are. So it's a bit of a, a, a watch this space, but it's good to sort of get that introduction to some of the research that's happening and some of the research that's in the pipeline. So we've been through the big lessons, we've looked at um, exemplars, we've had a talk about AIDS, um, some of the research tools. And so in our final little segment, we're going to think about the next steps. So in thinking about the um, next steps, perhaps, Ken, we will start again with you. Would you suggest for teachers and students and designers wanting to shift towards uh, improving the well-being of the user group that they've got something that they can do tomorrow or should they think more about where they want to be in five years and back cast from there? What would you suggest would be a, next, a good next step? Okay, um, I think from re the, the first thing is to think of the outcome that you want, not, not go to what we have to do. Uh, think of what do we actually want to achieve. Uh, we, we, we see this in acoustic design. Someone comes up and they say, this is what we need to do. We need to install a sound reinforcement system. But no one's actually stopped to say, what is the outcome we want? Because if you know the real outcome, there's, 15 different ways we can achieve that outcome. Some would be better than others, right? You don't close your mind to that. But I think the, the second point I will say is, uh, and this is certainly a learning point that I've had in the last two years, is to really listen. Listen not just to the cohort that you're serving, but listen to seemingly unrelated fields. So in acoustics now, we're, we're actually doing a lot of work in uh, psychoacoustics. You know, we're, we're actually diving into the user experience design field a lot. We are looking at behavioral economics, right? That's a big part as well because the incentives of space is, is really important to consider in any research program. Um, so, so in the same way, I think for learning environments, listen to the teachers, listen to the people who are, you know, helping to clean the space, for example, listen to the administrators, listen to the parents, listen to all these. And 
unless we open up the communication channels to get as much data as we can, uh, we will be closing ourselves off to possibilities, you know, for potentially so your, really, yeah. So your two next steps will be thinking about the, where you want to end up, which is kind of almost a positive, appreciative inquiry approach, isn't it? Is yes. don't worry about what's wrong now, but really think about where you want to be. And yes. your other piece of advice is just listen. Yes, yeah. Listen, listen to everyone involved. So, Diane, what would be your succinct next steps for people wanting to think about more positive environments? I think um, the stakeholder voice is really important and it's, it speaks a little bit to Simon's point about co-design and the importance of um, what Ken was just saying then about carefully listening. I think... Um, the ultimate aim is to get people engaged. You can have the most beautiful designs that um, potentially can create great outcomes, but if they're not connect connecting with that design element, um, then they're not going to derive the intended benefits. And so I think one of the ways... You mean if ways... the users aren't connecting with the design element? Right? Correct, so, yeah. So it's a matter of getting correlation or or synergies between what the designed environment is and what the users are doing and thinking. That's right. Because, um, yeah, for them to derive the benefits, they need to actually experience to the full extent um, the features of the design that um, are most conducive to delivering the um, health and wellbeing benefits. And, and ultimately, you know, you want... Uh, your design to translate into practice so that it creates those outcomes. And so I think the stakeholder voice is really important in that. And that's where I think um, sometimes the user wants to see the evidence that, um, uh, that they're going to benefit in some way from uh, connecting with that design feature or space. And I find that with wellbeing education, broadly speaking, um, in trying to understand how people connect with wellbeing education and trying to design wellbeing education so that they can translate it into their everyday practice, I find that they, they want this element of tangibility yeah. and, um, and yeah. that user engagement so that they can practice learning those skills. Yeah. And uh, it means that they need to invest in some way in coming up with the idea or contributing in some way to the idea. Um, and that's where I also think that um, data is really important and that a personalised element is really important. Um, and the other thing that I would say is um, take an interdisciplinary approach. So I think the different disciplines can offer so much um, whether it's psychology or education or um, design, um, there's just different perspectives that when you bring them together um, can create an amazing product or experience for an individual. And I think for me also, getting people um, involved in the space or design is really important when they can interact with it as an experience rather than something that's just a materialistic thing over there. Yes. So those experiential elements I think are really important. But mm -hmm. I think the, the person activity environment fit is a really important concept here. Yeah. Um, well, thank you, um, Ken and Diane and, and, and Simon. Next step for, for somebody wanting to perhaps go down a user experience. Um, I concur a lot with what's been said by both uh, uh, Diane and Ken. Like it is very much about um, providing those tools and, and putting yourself in, helping to put yourself in the shoes of people who actually want to use the, the physical spaces that you're doing. So, you know, coming into it with a degree, I guess, of uh, empathy and, and really a position of learning uh, and coming in to hear the voices from what um, the people that you're designing for are seeking. And then go to the point that Ken Diane um, put forward too, that interdisciplinary approach where taking those insights and then whether it be in terms of from a, 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 a cognitive wellbeing or whether it be from acoustic form of space and then seeing how that can then inform your own practice, I think is, is something that is um, you know, a, 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 good, a good journey to go. 
Simon, Ken and Diane, thank you so much for exploring our design for health and wellbeing in um, learning environments from so many different um, perspectives. It's been a bit of a roller coaster. We've introduced a lot of um, concepts. We might um, uh, be able to provide people who are interested with some resources, some of the resources that you've um, mentioned, um, aids, um, research. But um, I think this is a part of the conversation. There's lots, lots more to um, talk about, but thank you so much for um, joining the Learn at Home team today and um, discussing this really interesting topic. Thanks, Claire. Thank you, Claire. Pleasure.